Hi, good evening, everyone. As um, you are getting settled, uh, I'd like to welcome you to another evening of a Northshire Bookstore virtual event. My name is Dabith Wood. I'm the event manager at Northshire in Manchester, uh, Vermont. Um, as you noticed uh, when you were coming in, we are recording tonight's event uh, for later broadcast on our YouTube channel. Um, but don't worry, only those of us who are speaking and unmuted and I, in this nice little yellow box will be showing up there uh, in perpetuity. So please, at any time this evening, um, type your questions for our author in the chat, and then I'll save them and pose them uh, during the Q&A. Um, now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Pete Davis for his important book, Dedicated, The Case for Commitment in an Age of Infinite Browsing. Pete Davis is a civic advocate who works on projects aimed at deepening American democracy and solidarity. He is the co-founder of the Democracy Policy Network and Getaway, a company that provides simple, unplugged escapes to tiny cabins outside of major cities. His Harvard Law School graduation speech, A Counterculture of Commitment, has been viewed more than 30 million times. His new book, Dedicated, is based on that viral speech. None other than Dr. Cornell West has said that this is a magisterial book on the moral countercultural of commitment in our shallow culture of money and fear. His depth of wisdom and scope of knowledge are astonishing, and his powerful vision of decency and democracy are compelling. We are very lucky to be joined tonight by Sparky Abraham. He is a legal services attorney in California and the final financial editor for Current Affairs Magazine. Please join me in welcoming to Northshire Bookstore, Sparky Abraham and Pete Davis. Wow. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, uh, Pete, I, I'm, I'm really excited to be here talking to you about the book. We talk all the time, um, but I have not actually talked to you about your book yet. And so I'll try not to, uh, I'll try not to make this just a showering of praise because I really do love it. Uh, but can you, I guess I want to challenge you a little bit to describe, if you can, the book quickly, but try to describe the whole book and don't mention Netflix. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Well, um, first off, thank you so much uh, to this wonderful bookstore. I so appreciate you having me here. Thank you so much, Sparky, for being my conversant in this. Um, this is uh, this is such a joy to be here. Um, the I was going to wear my um, heavy flannel in honor of of uh, Northshire being in Vermont, but then I was told uh, by family members that it was too goofy to do so. So uh, glad to be here. Um, so the the basic, you know, maybe the best way to explain the summary of the book is to explain the why of the book, which is why did why did I give the speech that inspired this book, and why did I decide that it was worth expanding into a full book, and basically it starts with this feeling of many people in my age that were living in dark times. You know, there's a lot of uh, negative feelings about the world that we live in. You know, there's a sense that community is in decline, that there's major political problems, that our institutions have are not worth having faith in and, you know, are corrupted. Um, and a lot of hopes that we thought would fix many of these things uh, have been dashed in recent years. And um, we need guidance on what do we do about that? You know, how do we solve these great problems of our time? And how do we feel kind of at peace in existence about uh, living in times like these? And the message that I've gotten from a lot of elders in institutional learning session, set, settings like college and law school uh, was, you know, there's not much we can do, but you can keep your options open. You can work on making sure that your individual self is doing okay, and that you do a favor to your future self by uh, not getting tied down to anything, um, not uh, you know, not ending up with your high school sweetheart because you never know what's around the corner, not you know, committing to that first job because you never know what the next job will be, not speaking out too much because you never know what's going to change out there in the world, and you might uh, you know talk yourself into a bind, and. The ironic thing is that, you know, what I've discovered over time is that um, that doesn't lead to peace and that doesn't lead to impact and that doesn't solve the great problems of our time. And meanwhile, the people that we are all organically discovering that we respect, the people that we see as heroes, 
are in fact the people who totally ignored that advice, the people who made a commitment to particular things, particular people and institutions and causes and crafts and places. Long haul heroes who worked at things for a long time and closed doors and foregone options for the sake of them. And so this book is a tribute to those long haul heroes and a path forward to solve the great problems of our time and to find the type of impact, peace and joy we're all looking for through the act that those long haul heroes have taken, which is dedicating yourself to a particular thing. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good description, I, I will say, based on my reading of the book, but I wanna, I wanna push you a little bit farther on it, if that's okay. Um, Please do. Because I think that what you just described and how I've seen the book described in, in some, but not all of the, of the sort of reviews and, and press about it, is as a sort of, um, you know, it, it kind of is a self-help book and it is to some extent individually focused and it is to some extent an argument for what we all as individuals should be doing. And I came from a very similar uh, law school experience to yours and I remember very well, uh, you know, you got to do the thing that's going to open all the doors, right? You always want to open doors, open every single door, take the job that's going to open the most doors. Um, and you never you never think about which door you actually should go through other than the one that opens more. Um, but the book, I think, is a lot more than that. Um, and I, I think that you have a couple of, of very particular pivot points where you move from a discussion of what is good for us as individuals to discussions about what is good for us as a, uh, a civic society to discussions of what's good for us as a culture. And I think one of the things that you do really successfully in the book is you weave these things together. And the argument is that you have to do it all at the same time. And so I just wanted to, I want to ask you a little bit to, to expand on that a little bit more, um, because I found this paragraph on page 234, 200, page 234 of the book, <laughs> which is the closest that I could find of kind of like almost the thesis statement of the whole book. Uh, and what you say is you say, at the most fundamental level, this is the question presented here. What do we want the basic structure of our society to look like? Do we want individuals to act like free floating atoms with a few weak bonds between them? The structure of liquid modernity? Do we want some reactionary or apocalyptic cult to force all of the atoms into a rigid line? Or do we want to inspire the world to foster, grow, to foster and grow organic bonds to become a more solid world with more solid people? These are the fundamental stakes in the clash between the culture of open options and the counterculture of commitment. And I think that I felt like that was a very nice way of linking in the individual aspect of it, which you kind of started by talking about with what I think is like a really powerful aspect of the book, which is the social, cultural, civic uh, critique and vision. I am so glad you brought that up. And I, I think you did. I swear to the viewers out there, I did not tell Sparky that we didn't talk about this. <laughs> Sparky found that, but that is what I believe is kind of the deepest core of what I was trying to get across with the book, uh, the sentence he, he read out. And I think what you're getting at is basically half the book, the first half of the book, as my editor told me to do, you know, please be normal. He kept saying, you know, <laughs> please have the beginning of the book be about normal things um we experience as individuals you know kind of like a self-help spirit of the book and then if you can earn the trust of the reader in the back half of the book you can talk about some of the implications of what this will have on culture and society and politics which is you know as you can tell by my why of of writing this book is the reason i wanted to write it in the first place so let's talk about maybe the individual side first and then get to that cultural side so the way this and they're connected. They're two sides of the same coin. One is the, the culture that is created by this individual action. And alternatively, the counterculture is created by this rebellious action. So on the individual level, the kind of self-help half of the book, um, it talks about this common, you know, I, I try to talk about this common experience we all feel, which is we feel pressure to keep our options open and we end up in what I call infinite browsing mode. Um, browsing is good um, at different parts of our life. Browsing leads to flexibility. It allows things to be chill and us to 
explore without the stakes being too high. That flexibility and exploration allows us to find our authentic selves, to shed involuntary and inherited commitments that don't speak to us as, you know, free people. And it's really fun to browse, you know, nothing profound to say here, but trying out a hundred different things, um, watching all the trailers for a while is fun. But the point I'm trying to make is that these pleasures are haunted by pains. So the pleasure of flexibility is eventually haunted by choice paralysis. The psychologist Barry Schwartz talks about this as the paradox of choice. You know, you want some choices, but when you're overwhelmed with options, you suddenly feel too scared to choose anything. You know, um, you'd rather, you know, if you're at 31 flavors and you choose the rocky road, you're haunted by, should I have chosen the rainbow squirrel? Should I have chosen the butter pecan? Should I have chosen the world-class chocolate? And that's what it can be like with dating partners, swiping through apps, or, you know, choosing a career path or a vocation or finding a place to live. Uh, you know, the sense of authenticity you feel is eventually haunted by anime, you know, what uh, Emile Durkheim, the sociolog French sociologist called anime, a certain spiritual isolation. Um, not just that you're alone, but that you have no sense of meaning that orients you. And finally, you know, novelty, the fun of novelty eventually curdles into boredom. As anyone who's like flipped through a hundred TikTok videos or scrolled through Twitter for too long, even though the algorithm is presenting you with like the a hundred most interesting things on the internet that day, you eventually get bored because it's not the deepest joy and the deepest interest that comes with depth that can't come from be spectacle. It can only come from working at something for a long time. And so there's this individual story of these pleasures of browsing are eventually haunted by pains and you're stuck in infinite browsing mode and it would make you a lot happier. You'll find purpose, you'll find community, you'll find depth if you commit. But then what happens in a world where we're all infinitely browsing? Well, this is where we get to the cultural and political side. Our institutions are not stewarded. Our places are not loved and they cease to be places, they become f spaces. Our people are not cared for and no one has companions, they're lonely. Our crafts practices are not stewarded and we get worse at like the, the beautiful craft tools that we used to believe in or they, they start taking on less meaning because there isn't a community of people doing them together. Um, our causes that we need to, you know, the great causes of our time are not attended to because the most important um, quality, you know, the reason I originally wrote this book is this one single insight, which is the number one thing that all the causes that we care about fighting global climate change, deepening racial justice, deepening democracy, deepening economic equality, all these things we care about deeply. They only are going to happen if people are willing to dedicate themselves to them in the long haul. Nothing's going to happen in a year, but everything can happen in 10, 20, 30 years. And so, and there's no blueprint for solving any of these things. The most useful magic silver bullet are people and being dedicated and the improvisational, uh, you know, music of their action over time if they stay with it, um, that will solve those causes. That's how everything else that we've held precious in the past has, you know, we've held precious today was done in the past. And that's how everything we want precious in the future must be done today. And so um, you're going to start seeing all these consequences of a totally browsing, totally isolated world of institutions corrupted, places unloved, people unloved, causes un untended to. And um, that's the kind of uh, cultural argument of what happens if we all choose infinite browsing over a uh, uh, dedication. Th that's that's half the cultural argument. The other half of the cultural argument is what we could see if we were both more individually oriented toward dedication and socially culturally oriented toward dedication, right? I think that a big piece of what I took out of the book, which I really appreciated, was a sort of meditation on what, what a self even is. Uh, is it is it static or is it changing? You know, is it a thing or is it a process, right? Um, and, you know, the, this is one of the stealthy aspects of the book, I think, is that really it, it, like there, there is deep uh, epistemology here and deep metaphysics and deep civic theory and some really kind of large questions raised through, uh, through conversation with both some kind of more expected and less expected thinkers, yeah. right? Like I, I noticed on one page you had you went straight from Chapo Trap House to Kierkegaard. 
Um, yes, I tried to, I tried to grab everything. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, how does this, you know, when you're talking about, when you're, we're just talking about the self-help aspect of it, you know, it, it's kind of just in this colloquial sense, like, oh, what should I do? But one of the big things that, that comes out of this is, um, you know, like you say at one point, our identity is not fixed, but built through our relationships, right? We are building ourselves through our commitments. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that, like, how does that play in? What does that mean for ourselves? Uh, you know, actually on this kind of topic of the switching between self-help and kind of culture building, like collective self-help, basically, um, there's this part in the center of the book that I'm, I'm kind of proud of, which is I figured out basically, and I figured out in my weird, you know, none of this is science, you know, it's, it's kind of artistically figuring out. Um, the, one of the places where self-help meets culture criticism is I talk about these three fears of commitment. So very self-helpy aspect, but very relevant to us, which is like, you know, what are, what are the things in our individual lives pre preventing us from committing? One is fear of regret. You know, we're worried that 20 years from now, I'm going to wake up and wish I had committed to something else. There's fear of missing out, which is if I commit to something, it comes with responsibilities that prevent me from being everywhere with everyone. And there's this uh, one that's less talked about, fear of association, which is I'm worried that the commitment is going to threaten my identity or my reputation among my friends now or my sense of control. It's just working with people is messy. And people are like, oh, I want tips and tricks for overcoming these fears. You know, that's I could have gone the self-help route and um, I could have gone the self-help route and gone like, okay, here are 10 ways to overcome the fear of regret. But as I talked with long haul heroes, I interviewed 50 long haul heroes, people who worked on things for a long time for the book. And I talked with other people my age and reflected on my own journey and commitment. It hit me that each of these to overcome these fears, you have to have like a big switch of your understanding of kind of existence uh, to overcome these fears. It like really implicates your whole being in the world. So let me just quickly walk through them. The fear of regret, you know, it's all about that I'm trying to, you start analytically optimizing like the choice that you're making. What is the absolute optimized option that I should pick? Who's the perfect person for me, the perfect place, the perfect job, the perfect cause, the perfect craft. And the switch you need to make is you have to understand that it's not the original choice that usually leads to the satisfaction. It does that leads to the optimization. You know, no one wants to be assigned to things randomly. This isn't an argument that arranged marriages work. But with a little half of the battle is choosing, but the other half of the battle is making your commitment work by fully committing to it and diving in. That when you fully commit and dive into something, your meaning is rewired by your commitment, your sense of meaning. You become a Texan by moving to Texas and that becomes the way in which you analyze things. You, when you marry a person, that becomes your reality. That becomes a sense of yourself. So um, you can't really regret it in a sense. You can regret some choices. Some divorces are meant to be. This isn't a like finger waggy, never quit anything. Um, but your your being becomes part of what you've chosen and your meaning is reassessed. Um, on missing out, you have to start seeing that what you're mi the deepest things you're missing out on are when you don't commit are the joys of committing basically like being in your having your 10 year anniversary, becoming an elder in a community, seeing your project come off the ground, mastering a craft that those that depth you know, the joy of depth is really what you're craving, not, you know, forever chasing the hottest new thing. And then the deepest part that you talked about is that in this fear of association, you know, we're scared that the others, you know, joining this religion, joining this political cause, joining this institution, becoming fully in this vocation, moving to this place and not moving to other places is going to threaten who we are. But what you discover is it becomes you, you know, those relationships become part of who you are, your identity is grown through your relationships, your reputation is burnished through your relationships. What do we call someone um, who doesn't have any relationships, like a fair weather fan or a, not a solid person? What do we call a person who has a lot of relationships and is loyal to them and fully becomes particular? A solid person, you know? Um, and finally, you feel like you're giving up a sense of control by entering these communities, you think, and you think the community will threaten you. 
But actually, you talk to people who are deep in a community who feel deep solidarity 10 years into a union, 10 years into a cause together, 10 years into a relationship, and you actually find you're more empowered, you're more in a sense of control, you're more comfortable at the end. And what I was trying to get at at the book is just, it's less of like 10, t 10 tips, you know, 10 tips and tricks and more, can we have these, can we start noticing these fate, these shifts that allow us to live in a different way? Yeah, I, I had put a big star in my notebook here as I was reading and I said, hinge chapter, fear of association. And because that's yeah. really, that's where you bring, that's where you connect. You say, it's not about individuals and communities. These things are interdependent. They can, can constitute each other. Um, it, I really appreciated the way that you sort of addressed the, the, the FOMO type thing too, because again, going back to my experience in law school, which I'm sure was similar to your experience, there's this notion of risk aversion and people will say things like, well, I'm just going to go, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I like, I'm just going to, I'm going to go to the law firm. It's going to keep, it's going to keep all my options open. I just don't want to take any risks. Right. Um, and it's always struck me as a very funny concept because like you think of you're, you're thinking of very particular risks, but you're not thinking of others. And I think one of the things you do here is you do a really good job explaining what you are risking by doing a thing that is not the thing that you really care about, but that will keep your options open. I had this discovery only after I only had this during the book tour. I, I, I'm sad I didn't get into the book, which is this compassion for the infinite browser, which I am as well. And let me just start the caveat here. I am not a long haul hero myself. This isn't one of those books where it's like, I lost 100 pounds and you can too. It's, um, it's, I am a super fan. And I talk to a lot of people who, you know, who are long haul heroes. Um, but one of the things I discovered, um, in the book tour um, from talking with people is a lot of people browse, infinitely browse and keep their options open because they care about their future self, which is actually a good quality. Like this is the whole point of the marshmallow test. We are trying to teach kids, you know, one of the things you're trying to teach kids is don't just serve your present self, save a little portion for your future self. Like that's the like grasshopper and the ant or, you know, one of these moral tales. And, you know, you, you can't, you know, don't spend it all now, you know, take care of your future self. And when we are keeping our options open and you actually see it at these like high meritocratic fancy schools, because it's like the kids that are very serious about taking care of their future selves, um, they keep their options open the most because they think they're helping. They think themselves five years from now is going to say, thank you so much for not closing any doors on me. But what I'm saying is that's coming from a good place, but you're mistaken yourself five years from now will look back and thank you for choosing something because the benefits of dedicating yourself to something get bigger over time <laughs> you know you get more purpose you get more community you get more depth and mastery and with that more impact and joy and so what your future self really needs you to do the best favor you can do for your future self is dedicate yourself to something now go to that first meeting and get through the awkward period where you're wearing name tags and asking people how's the weather you know so that you can get to the point where you're you belong and you're comfortable you know dive into that relationship so you can get through the point where you need to learn how to cooperate with each other and then suddenly you you know um you have all the memories and you have all the inside jokes and you have everything dive into that craft where you have to go through the first year where it's painful and you don't know what to do and you aren't as good as your taste as ira glass likes to talk about um so that five years from now you can be a master and enjoy all the fruits of mastery um that uh that's uh that's kind of another switch which is it's good you're taking care of your future self but you've got your future self wrong this isn't a question so much as it is just a compliment, but you mentioned your 50 interviews and it actually took me a little while to realize while I was reading the book that, you know, that you were, that you were presenting me with interviews. They're so, they're like folded in like little, like chocolate chips into the book. They're, they're both pervasive and, and like you almost don't even notice them. And I, I thought that was really important because it's good to realize, and you do this through the choice of people who you talk to that like, there are so many people who are doing great things who aren't writing books about it or writing articles. You can't just go read about all the good stuff in the world. Yeah, no, I was, this is one of my great prides in this book, you know, um, that, you know, 
the way, you know, I interviewed Ken Burns, you know, super famous person. I interviewed Evan Wolfson, who is the person who's one of the singular figures most responsible for the, us having gay marriage um, in the United States. But then I also interviewed, you know, the tattoo part, the tattoo artist in my town. I interviewed, I put out a call just saying, I want to interview moms and dads. I want to interview people. I interviewed one person just about being a friend, you know, who's a really good friend. Um, I, and, you know, tried to find examples that, you know, one of the big messages of the book is that why I wanted to coin this phrase counterculture of commitment is I wanted you to feel like all of your acts of dedication are part of a big project, a global project. Um, I have a very sappy paragraph that, um, you know, you can roll your eyes at, but I, I wanted to put it in, which was just like, you know, when you care for a person, when you're dedicated to one person, you are part of the project of caring for everyone because you're doing your one part in that. When you tend to one place, you are part of the project of tending to all the places because someone needs to tend to that place and you've taken up a chair in that orchestra, you know? Um, when you take on one cause, and I wanted to say, you know, for all the people out there that feel like there's so many problems and I can't work on it all and thus I work on none. I wanted to say, when you work on one cause, you're part of the project of all the people working to build a more just world. And I wanted you to feel part of a counterculture of commitment. and. So that's the the from the most ordinary to the most publicly extraordinary. It's all extraordinary. Um, Here, here's a self help question for you for me. Uh, I want help. <laughs> uh, so much of the book is really about uh, ritual, it, uh, ritual and sort of the sacredness that you can that you can create through ritual and tradition. Uh, I grew up in an extremely uh, not anti-ritual, but ritualless, I would say, environment. And I, I believe that is not <laughs> how you grew up. I think that I've heard you say before that, that you had a, a lot of ritual and tradition. And I guess my question for you is, how do you sort of enact this in your, do you, do you find yourself ritualizing things are you creating traditions for yourself in your daily life and how do you do it yeah you know let me first i will first say this and then i'll get directly at the end the, the question first i'll say i wrote this book you know i'm a you know i'm a, a lefty and i'm a modern you know i believe you know I, I have a whole section in the book on uh you know sometimes i sound like a, a traditionalist conservative when talking like this you know it's about loyalty and fidelity and all these things um, but I actually wrote this book partially for fellow, I wrote it for everyone, but I, I, I wrote it kind of specifically at heart. It might resonate more than average with lefties and modern people who actually don't come from like a rich inherited tradition. And part of the message of this book was about our capacity for our roots to lie, not just in the past, but also in the future. This is not a book where, this is actually a book for people who might look at the book and think, oh, well, I'm not from, a, you know, I'm not from a rich tradition. I'm not from a rich community. I'm not from a place that had dedication as value. So this book isn't for me. It's actually, I wrote it specifically for you to say, we need to revive all these dedications or create new ones. And our roots don't just have to be in the past. Our roots can be in the future. And when we enact dedication, we are throwing, you know, we are grabbing onto a root in the future by saying this thing is going to last into the future. And let me start repopulating some of these constellations of meaning that might have fallen apart by the time I got to my my generation. Um, uh, so that's that's that there. So I would say like, um, so then how do we do it? Um, well, uh, what, how do you do it? Show me your future roots, Pete. Give me an example. Yeah, here. you know, you know, I, I, I think there's two ways. Like one is I don't think ritual is absolutely necessary. I think it is a very useful tool that some people find. Um, and um, because like the best way for a civic club to survive, I always tell people is set a routine meeting time. That's the first thing you should do and just go and have the routine meeting time meet Wednesday at seven, even before you know what to do. <laughs> um, because the meeting Wednesday at seven is going to be the hardest part. And if you get that going now, 
you will start talking about what should we do during this hour we're together Wednesday at seven or something, um, you know, or every other Sunday or the first Friday at the town square or whatever, because the ritual is like a stake in the ground that will make sure it lives on. Um, but, you know, one of the beautiful things is, and so I have some of those in my life. You know, I have, I have civic groups I'm part of that have routine meetings. Um, I have people I try to kind of call in a clip. I'm trying to start some annual traditions. Um, and, you know, those have a routine to them. But I think another part of this is the message that out of the spirit of dedication comes everything that is needed for dedication to work. So my favorite story I shared in the book is the story of, and it's if it's okay, if I could go a little long-winded on this story, because I think it's worth it. Um, the story of Wendell Berry's bucket, um, which is he tells this story, Wendell Berry, the great farmer philosopher uh, from Kentucky, he tells the story of this bucket on his father's farm that everyone had forgotten about. It was a bucket nailed to the signpost um, or fence post. And over time, it had gathered, you know, because no one had paid attention to it, feathers fell into it, animals crawled in and died into it, bugs fell in and ate on the animals, dirt fell in, rain fell in, leaves fell in. And when he checked it for the first time in 10 years after people had forgotten about it, he looked inside and he said, oh, wow, the most miraculous thing has happened. Out of all these things falling through time, they have made earth in this bucket. And he said, culture is the same way. Um, memories fall through time, best practices fall through time, crazy traditions fall through time, songs fall through time, turns of phrases, inside jokes, um, uh, you know, things we should never do again, you know, <laughs> rules of thumb to make things easier. But those things all dissipate in human interaction unless someone decides to be stable, unless someone decides to be the bucket that's nailed to the fence post and forgotten about and not carried anywhere else. Um, by having some form of stability, by being the old guard in the institution, by sticking with a project for a long time, by sticking with a person, by sticking in a place, by sticking with a cause, you can be the bucket. And what is the metaphor that he's trying to say? What is the earth? The earth is culture. Um, that's what culture is. Culture is something that, um, it, you know, the original thing is agriculture. It's something that makes it easier for people to grow in. You know, it is a thing that is conducive to growth. And so, what does that have to do with your question? If you are stable, if you have dedication, the culture will come naturally because you're human. You'll have memories, you'll have songs, you'll have things you'll say, you'll have, let's never do that again. Remember 1997, you know, um, and what that, all those things together is in a stable vessel is culture. And that'll naturally make a ritual arise. And a ritual is one type of piece of culture. There are other pieces, you know, um, so yeah. I don't know if that answers it, but do you have do you have a do you have a alternative do you do you have any ritual you've found that has worked? No, I'm in the process of trying to come up with some, which is why <laughs> I wanted you to give me some ideas. And you mentioned I noted that you mentioned that you are in the process of creating some too, but you didn't say what they were, and I won't make. Yeah, I will say to. this: um, if someone finds this, you might be able to put pins together. But I'm currently thinking up an annual um, f folk tradition for my town that I don't want to have associated with my name, but want to become a mysterious folk tradition. And if yes. someone finds this video, you will be able to figure it out. But <laughs> just wait, False Church, Virginia. Um, so, but it's a good reminder. Someone has to do it. Someone yeah. has to create the annual, you know, Easter egg roll. Someone has to create the new, there was a, I read about in my town, the guy who invented the star drop in Falls Church, Virginia, my little town outside DC. Someone, we drop a star from the tallest building in Falls Church. It's like um, six stories tall. It's, <laughs> it's like, it's our ball drop. And one guy, and we have the city crane, just drop it down. There's nothing more special we could do. And it's one guy <laughs> thought it up and said, we need a new year's tradition and did it. And now we do it over and over again, every year for 20 years. So. Um, someone's got to be the long haul hero to get things, these things going that bring us joy in our life. I, I, I noticed one of my favorite quotes that you had in the book, you hit it all the way back in your, um, what was the section called? It's like, uh, inspirations or something. Uh, yeah. Something. Influences. influences. Yeah. Yes. Which is, uh, I believe it. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but your your favorite philosopher thinker, Roberto Unger, yes, uh, yeah. who said, hope is the consequence of action. 
And I felt like that really summed up a lot of what your point of the book was. Yeah, you know, it's, um, this is in some ways what dedication is an action verb, you know? <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm probably not the first to say that. There's probably somewhere online. But um, when we're talking, some people said to me, you know, um, is this about dedication to, you know, a gym routine? Or is this about dedication to, um, to like a health regimen? And I, I'm always, that's the only time I kind of push back. I say, no, this is about dedication to things outside yourself with other people, you know, places, people, causes, communities, institutions, craft practices. And, um, and all of those involve action, making things happen, caring for people, uh, advancing a cause, uh, keeping an institution running. I talked to stewards, you know, people who kept an institution running and they all taught me keeping an institution running is not stewardship is not keeping something in amber in glass um it is tending to a living thing like raising a baby or something you know it's like raising a um it's it's um inheriting something and doing what needs to be done live and new so that you can pass it on and um all of them are action verbs and all the people who were dedicated they were filled with hope you know that's that's why you know how i started this 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 talk when you asked me why it's because so many people my age are filled with cynicism and I don't think the answer is, oh, be hopeful while sitting down because actually things are good. You know, as some there's there's a famous book out there that says, don't be hopeless because things are actually good. You don't have to do anything. You know, there's some books out there. That's a genre of books. That's not what this is. This is there are a lot of dark things. There is a lot of isolation. There is a lot of institutional corruption. There are a lot of political messes. There are a lot of global crises. But people who are dedicated on those to institutions, to caring for people, to advancing causes, they're the hopeful people in them. They're clear-eyed. They're clear-eyed, especially about how long things will take, but they see the paths forward. Um, they see the way out. And um, and it, it lives up to that quote, hope is the, is the consequence of action, not the cause of action. I have another question for you, but it's kind of a... Um maybe a pushing back question and, and you, your answer might be long. So I don't know if maybe we want to see if other folks have I'll questions. Keep it short. I'll I can keep fill it in. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, not to cross plug, but you and I had a conversation for the current affairs magazine podcast uh, a couple months ago um, about pragmatism. Uh, yeah. The school of pragmatism as, as philosophy, which is something that you're into and which I think like really pervades this book, I would say both in the people that yes. you draw from and in the, the spirit that it captures. And one of the interesting things that I took out of that conversation was this move. I think it's fair to call it a move where you go, you know, yes, what we want, we want a lot of radical democratic experiments all the time, but that doesn't include the bad things because a lot of those aren't really democratic. <laughs> even, even if a lot of people choose something bad, we can kind of do a little move to say, well, you know, the, the principle that we're talking about kind of excludes some things on principle. And we talked a little bit about when that works and when that doesn't work. And I, I sense a little bit of a similar move that you do in this book at points, right? Um, I think you do it really successfully. I'm convinced by it. But I think you, you know, you could have written the self-help book alone that is about dedicating yourself to something. Uh, and it could have been all about business right? Like a business book, business dedication, uh, or it could have been, it could have included like going to the gym or like, you know, dedicate, dedicate yourself to making money. Right. Yeah. I think that the way that you have defined dedication in the book and the counterculture of commitment actually requires the thing that is dedicated to, to be something different and more of substance. Um, and I think it's I think it's right and it's clever and it's also a little bit of a move. <laughs> so I wonder if you could just talk about that. Yeah, you know, I think there is a thing inside of dedication, which is like persistence and persistence can apply to your gym routine, you know, or, you know, your decision to be happy every day or something, you know, um, and uh, win a gold medal for yourself alone, you know. Um, and so I think to be dedicated to causes and communities and people, it will require that same like gritty persistence or whatever. But, you know, I talk about the reason I chose the word dedication is that, um, you know, uh, 
that dedicate has two meanings, like the word itself. Um, one is to stick at something for a long time, you know, like they were dedicated to the project. And the other is to make something holy, like we dedicated the church or we dedicated the memorial. And I just feel like the deeper, more holier, more, you know, sanctified type of persistence is the persistence to others. Now, let me bring that back to earth a bit and then I'll, I'll wrap up quickly so we can go to audience questions. This book falls within a tradition um, that I that is called the communitarian tradition. And basically the giant academic and literary and cultural project of communitarian tradition is to say, specifically today, in this point in time, we have too much isolation and individualism. At another point in time, we might have had too much conformity and, you know, uh, conformity and, and uh, rigidness and uh, smothering by, uh, you know, by others. And the project should have been, you know, rebellion, think for yourself, di disattach, sacrilege, you know, all those things. And in some, you know, the world's always complex. There are some things where we still need that. But what the communitarian believes, and I consider myself part of this and this book part of that, is that the big thing going on is we're way too isolated, way too individualistic. And even our individualism and isolation will eventually collapse as well because you need to tend to some communal things to even preserve your individualism, um, as we can see by recent, you know, disturbing things happening in politics. You can't just hide in the woods and hope it all works out. Um, and so it's part of this project of pushing back and rebalancing. And so, you know, if I was coming up in the 50s when uh, there was, uh, I think I would have maybe not felt like this book was as needed <laughs> at the moment, but when I'm coming up in a time where I feel like we're having trouble attaching to things, when we're having trouble and working on anything bigger than ourselves, especially the continued liberation projects that were started back then, mm -hmm. um, uh, they, uh, this, is the, this is the message of the time, um, at least from me uh, for this. <laughs> um, and so uh, commitment isn't always what's the most needed thing to be said but now it's especially needed to be said. Okay, do we wanna see if there are any questions from the audience? I I could call on someone in particular, if that would be helpful. Um, Sparky, Pete, this has been really inspiring. Um, thank you both so much. We have a, a question or a comment here from Cruz. She says, uh, I'd also add uh, on that I liked how he did not provide an exact roadmap or specificity on how you can be dedicated allows you to recognize aspects of your own life and experience and implement the concept. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm so glad you bring that up. I, this book actually, you know, I, I, I started um, my journey in like being interested in these topics in this specific type of dedication, which is this kind of movement called localism actually very prominent in Vermont. There's a lot of localists in Vermont, um, which is the spirit of being rooted in a specific place. Um, I was very inspired by this writer, Bill Kaufman, who wrote this wonderful book called Look Homeward America, which was a tribute to all the people who stuck in one place and, you know, the regionalist art movement, the people, Dorothy Day running a neighborhood Catholic worker center, you know, uh, uh, George McGovern as the South Dakota poet, right? Wendell Berry writing about Kentucky. And I was thinking, oh, I, I have to be a localist. You know, that's the most important message. I'll need to be a localist. But then, you know, over time, you meet all these different types of people and some people, they're calling is not to be dedicated to a place. Maybe they're so dedicated to a person that they need to move around for them. Maybe they're so dedicated to a cause that they need to move around and be part of an international global you know, project. Maybe they're um, so dedicated to an institution that they're willing to be transferred by that institution to help the institution grow. Um, in my religious uh, tradition, Catholicism, there's Benedictines who are committed to their monastery and there are Jesuits who fly around doing adventures, you know, and the church finds it necessary for both of them to exist. And so I actually wanted to find, it's not really the, dedication to place that I was drawn to. I was drawn to the dedication in the localists, that they felt rooted. And one of my messages of this book is that all these different types of dedication root you. They give you meaning, they give you purpose, they give you community, they give you depth, they help orient you in an existence. Um, and it doesn't just have to be um, to place. And I'm happy you, I, I really worked hard to not have this be a one size fits all thing. And so I talk about, um, causes and communities and crafts and 
uh, institutions and people as well. That sense of rooting, I was thinking about it earlier when you were talking about sort of being uh, rooting in a sense of hopefulness. There's no one use, in my experience, at least more hopeful than someone like John Lewis, who was so rooted to what, a, you know, a cause like that and, you know, sort of inspiring. I, I, amen. You know, that I was so, you know, I mentioned, as, as Barker will tell you, I mentioned the civil rights movement throughout like major character in the book, I think like Martin Luther King is, and the civil rights movement figures are mentioned way more than any other area of history um, in the book. And it is such a story of multifaceted dedication. You know, it's it's a story to this cause. And they, you know, I, I interviewed some of the veterans. I interviewed Bob Moses, who died last week, rest in peace, one of the great heroes of, of uh, the civil rights movement. And you know, they all told me it's a marathon, not a sprint. We were thrown into random towns and um, we were we started with, can you recruit two people? Can you recruit four people? Can you recruit 12 people? Can you wait two years with those 12 people? You know, um, uh, and one of them told me, you know, Jesus only had 12 apostles. I had to be happy with having 12 people in this town that were working on this cause. And, you know, one very interesting thing about Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement we don't appreciate it was very rooted in place as well, even though it became a global cause. He said, Martin Luther King said in his very early writing for the many, many years before he got more and more global, he said, my job is to have a revolution in the South. You know, <laughs> And one of the points I try to make in the book is, oh, was he trimming it? A... I think we lost you there, Pete. Hmm. Uh, Give us a second we'll, to see if he can come back. Well, we'll he'll be back in just a minute. Yes, um, I'm sure. Um, in the meantime, Sparky. Yes, I, I loved what he was saying about ritual, and it was what we were talking about a little bit beforehand. I think there's nothing better, a uh, better opportunity to start ritual than with a new family. Um, we have created so many rituals with our with our family and weird things, uh, chicken tetrazzini on Easter Eve uh, because of a YouTube video, things like that. It, it really is great, and um, you know our kids adore it, and uh, they're they're older now, and they're creating it. Um, with their own families. Now. Yeah. Hi, you're I, back, Pete. Pete's back. Sorry about that. I don't know. It must be the, the Wi-Fi. Um, I very quick sum up of that point was if they had decided to start a global committee to solve every problem, they wouldn't have done anything and they wouldn't have inspired what eventually became, you know, a movement that seriously has inspired a global committee to solve every problem because they were focused on being dedicated in a specific place. Um, and, that and I mean, just that's that's true both with the start and with the continuation right in that when when martin luther king wanted to address uh problems of poverty in chicago what did he do he moved he moved to chicago right yes <laughs> he said let's have an actual uh thing happening here and you know some other people who have had you know longer legs even criticized him and said you need to be even more rooted mm -hmm. you know that was like ella baker and family hammer you know let's get even more committed and really have like neighborhood you know neighborhood councils built up over time so um what an inspiring uh group of people and you know i really wanted to call attention to the the people that were starting in the 30s you know not just the people that had the big cinematic moment at the end but the people who were alone at the beginning um because that's who we need to be for the causes of our time yeah uh and we were just talking about uh sort of ritual creation through family creation just before you came back um it, it's definitely the case that that among the main tropes in the book is parenthood um and I guess I just wanted to give a shout out to the fact that, that you're with your mom in the room right now, who also appears in the book. My mom is here. <laughs> um, and a great, uh, I, I dedicated it, uh, the book to my parents who are, I said, they're the first long haul heroes that I met. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's, um, I also, you know, part of this was to say, uh, you know, if you don't believe people can be dedicated anymore, just look at the two lasting things of dedication and think about how amazing it is. Think about how amazing it is that we still have people that are dedicated to one person over time. Um, even though the spark happened at one time, they're still with them 15 years later. Think about how miraculous it is that someone, you know, 
creates children and then sticks with them for, <laughs> for 20 years and more. Um, uh, we are definitely capable of this. And, you know, that's why we have idioms like this project is my baby or I'm married to the shop. Um, it's because we have that capacity in us and that's the most popular form of commitment. And Wendell Berry actually said, um, the, the simplest metaphor to think about my message to the world is I want there to be more marriages, um, not just marriages to people, but marriages to places, marriages to causes, marriages to institutions. Um, and we can learn a lot from the part that we think is totally natural and normal and unprofound, but I find it quite profound that it happens all around us. Did we lose you there again at the end? Or is the Wi-Fi OK? Uh, no. Nope. OK. Um, I think okay. we are just about out of time. But I had one other uh, question comment uh, that I occurred to me just as this morning. I was reading uh, in a new book, Stuart Jeffries on, on postmodernism. He's talking at the beginning of it about sort of the paradox of choice, how in this uh, post-Fordist late capitalism, we are inundated by all these choices. Um, but he says we're uh, like on the proverbial wheel of Ixion, trapped by our own desires. And we have all of these choices for maybe um, so many colors of a car that we don't even hear of them. And so how is it that when we were given so much choice, it actually is a sort of a detriment, it, just in terms of the Netflix stuff, moving away from you know civil rights, the height of civil rights now, <laughs> you, know, the, yeah. you know, what am I gonna stream tonight? Um, to, you know, sort of it takes, it seems to almost take away our economy. Yes, um, two things to say on that. Um, one is, um, one is first off, it's just a good reminder that, and I have a whole chapter in the book on this, that this isn't all happening in a vacuum. Like we're not all deciding to become browsers instead of being dedicated. This is part of the story of our economy and the structure of, you know, how capitalism works and how, you know, the institutional structure at large and politics and education and moral culture. So um, this is not, uh, I'm not naive to think that this is just all happening in a vacuum. As to the particulars of the paradox of choice, yeah, you know, this is the great book on this. It's not, it's not my book. It's, it's, uh, it's Barry Schwartz's The Paradox of Choice, which is a great inspiration to this. And Barry Schwartz is another, is kind of a hero of mine in the style of writing, which is mix this individual experience with how it affects the full culture. Um, and he writes about basically like, that, that what is the paradox? The paradox is we want some choice. No one wants no, no, no options. But then suddenly when you're inundated with hundreds and hundreds of options and the internet has just taken it to an omega point, you know, customize everything, um, you know, have everything in your life can change. Anything can become something else. It can be optimized. He talks about, you know, the, the, the intricate techniques of why that is so bad. You know, one is we're haunted by the choices that we didn't choose, the options we didn't choose. We're haunted by the Frankenstein mixes of the options we didn't choose. So when you're thinking, should I live in Miami or should I live in DC or should I live in Austin? You're not just haunted if you choose Miami's beaches by DC's museums and Austin's food and, you know, uh, you know uh, California's uh, weather. You're haunted by a mythical place that your mind has created in its head that has free museums and great food and mythical weather. Um, and finally, the expectations on you when you have all these choices. You're now accountable for optimizing if you make all these choices, if you have all these choices. So everyone's like, oh, wow, looks like they didn't pick an optimized choice. And so that haunts you more, which is why people flip a coin to decide a restaurant when they're in a big group of people. They want it to be chosen for them. And, um, and so th there is something about our society from the least profound stuff of, you know, uh, acid wash jeans or not, as Schwartz talks about, to the most profound of who am I going to be with? What am I going to be? Where am I going to be? You know, what am I going to put my life energy towards? Um, it has a detrimental effect. Well, uh, th this has been an inspiring evening. Pete, Sparky, thank you both so much. The book is dedicated. You can order it in Northshire in the link in the chat. Um, what an evening. Thank you both so much and um, have a great night, guys. Thank you so much. And you and this wonderful um, institution is a great exemplar of the theme of the book. So uh, I've been around 45 years, I just learned before I started. So um, that's so great and, and keep up the good fight there. Thank you. And thank you, Sparky. Thank you everyone for coming.
always lovely to talk, Pete, and thank you. Thank you, everyone who came. This was great. I really had a nice time. Me too. Have a great evening, everyone, and uh, see you all again soon, in person, hopefully.